Hello, everyone. I'm Marilyn Moore, and I'm here with John Moore, as I always am, but with an important addition. We have a special, wonderful co-host for our next three um, shows in our new series that John will explain in a minute, and that is Gina Fidel, and we'll be hearing from her in just a minute, but we're uh, just super thrilled to have her co-hosting this series with us. <clears throat> Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can see our show today is the basics of using your website as a business asset, but we're going to go on to do a little bit to give a shout out to our sponsors. As soon as John brings up that slide. We're here at the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce. I usually say beautiful sunny Oceanside. This is one of the few days of the year that it's cloudy, but it's still beautiful. We're a stone's throw from the beach. And um, you can see that Oceanside is a very active chamber, a very progressive chamber. They had to have us here, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we're really uh, thrilled to be partnering with Oceanside Chamber. John and I are uh, Sonic Spider LLC with two branches, Right Start Websites, which is what we represent on um, Google Plus, and our other um, part of our business is Sonic Web Tech for on-demand tech support and um, PayPal and um, all of those sorts of technical services. And Gina is um, part of a two-person team. She and her husband, Doug, are um, Bad Eyes Web Development in another very beautiful area, Santa Barbara, uh, California, and uh, just have the most uh, utmost respect for their web firm and a little bit there about what they do. And our uh, production engineer is Richard P. Hanna. Uh, with our setup, we're not able to show him live, but he but is. There's, there's a picture of him, <laughs> and you might go back to the slide so they can see. He has created a computer network and his uh, IT solutions, and we love him and use him all the time ourselves. So, okay, now very happy to have Rich. And then we have a fantabulous panel. It is an all-star panel. We have Ammon John, and Ammon is. Uh, Online marketing, he just knows everything about it. SEO, he's he's just a, uh, one of the most respected um, persons in that field. And I just love this quote by Rand Fishkin of Moz, so I'm going to have to read this. Ammon Johns is one of the brightest minds and most talented individuals in the fields of search engine and internet marketing. I can think of few people in the field from whom I've learned more or been more impressed by. If you have the rare opportunity to leverage Ammon's immense at intellect and experience say yes and we are saying yes today so we're just thrilled to have Ammon here and then we're doing um, boy girl boy girl I understand so we're going to go with Mary Iannotti next Mary I had the pleasure of meeting on Google Plus um, it's just a um, knows so much about marketing and about business sense and she just um, is the real deal is does a wonderful job of helping her clients and helping others on Google Plus. Oh, thank you. Last <laughs> but <laughs> not least is Mike Bass, and he is coming from Arizona, I believe. Mary's in Colorado, and Emma's in the UK. And he specializes in helping businesses grow. He's a growth and development specialist and um, knows all sides of business. So. We're just Click on. super delighted to have them all here to discuss our topic. And John, that's you. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, this is a three-part series that uh, we started up. I've been thinking about this for a long, long time. And that is focusing on uh, an idea that has been sort of on my mind for many, many years, but has really been crystallizing lately. And that is uh, the idea of a website as uh, as a business asset. Now there are three things that motivated this for me in this series. Uh, the first of course is our customers that we've had who have come to us and we've found that oftentimes their website didn't address their business. And I had the unfortunate privilege of telling them the bad news and that is they needed to start all over again, which is kind of a, a, a depressing thing to tell a prospective customer that, oh gee, you know, you really can't get from here to there, so you need to start all over. That's kind of depressing, and, and I agree with that. 
The other motivation is that within the industry of web development, it's pretty much taken for granted that your website is a integral part of your business. So much so that it isn't even talked about that much. It just sort of passed over like one of those obvious things in an industry. And, and because of that, I think the small business people who listen and read, they kind of miss the value there of, of why this is so obvious. And the last motivation is been the trend now to give away these free websites, both places like web.com and GoDaddy, you know, one dollar will do it all for you, kind of a mentality where they encourage you to slap up the website and then think about it later on, what you're going to do with it. And so that mentality is, is out there being marketed on television and stuff. And so those three things brought together with kind of inspired this series. And now we'll talk about today's, uh, Gina, we'll talk about today's uh, show, which is the first part of this series. So, Gina? Well, first of all, I just really want to say what an honor it is that you have asked me to collaborate with you, John and Marilyn, on this project. It's been really fun working with you, and I think your point, John, about the fact that some of the things that we're going to be talking about don't get said. They get taken for granted so frequently that we forget to address them, and that's been a real, something that I've really observed as well, in myself also, I think that we can glide right over certain very, very critical concepts and points because we take them for granted. So, you know, we've been in the business of doing of de de web development and design since 1998, and that's a lot of websites and it's, it's a lot of clients. And so we've had a lot of examples to see how small businesses and nonprofits regard their websites and how they conceptualize the potential of their websites. And today we're going to be talking about some of the basics and things that you really need to start with. And that really begins, for me, with a question and sort of realigning our thinking. If we're going to be thinking about our websites as a business asset, it takes a certain shift. Um, and it really comes down to making, sort of creating the appropriate attitude towards your website, giving it the value that it deserves, that your business deserves for it to have. And, you know, your clients, your customers, are, your donors, your members, they're going to create an identity for you. If you don't do it for yourself, then you're going to lose the potential and the control to kind of shape and, and, and create that. And it's going to happen whether you do it or not. And in that identity development and the creation of your website, you also need to consider how best it's going to serve your customer, not just your business. And all of those things wrapped together are what going to, are going to make that business asset that you need. So with that, and you know, something else that John said too about the lack of continuity between entities and their representations of themselves online is a really big factor. And when you're doing a new design or a development of your website, you have the opportunity then to rethink the whole package and considering it as a business asset is really going to be your safest way to go and your most productive way to go. So today we're going to start just with the basics and that shift in thinking and we'll have other episodes where we can get kind of more into some of the nitty gritty. So, thanks. Yes, um, yeah, the, the, the next episode of next month is going to be on integrating your website and your business, both, both directions, and then after that we'll focus on the visibility issues and we haven't really nailed down what all that is yet, but it'll be uh, revolving around visibility, about making your website and your business both offline and online visible. Okay, we're going to start off with a kind of quick sort of round robin with our panel for one kind of a question and, and give them a chance to introduce themselves and how they're thinking of website as a, as a, as a, uh, a business asset. And also, uh, I want to also add, throw in the idea as, as they're talking of, of, the, of, the, of the often said statement that a poorly executed website is often um, um, something that is almost worse than having no website at all. So uh, you can do it so badly or you can do it badly enough that you probably shouldn't have done it at all. 
So that's kind of a, a, an interesting concept that I've, I've heard said at, at various times. So we're going to start off with you, Ammon, and then we'll go to Mary and Mike, and we're going to kind of introduce yourself and uh, give your thoughts on this sort of opening idea. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, uh, my name is Ammon Johns. I've been working in online marketing exclusively since 96. I started as a web developer just before that. And it, it really came naturally from building a website in those early days where we'd kind of all been promised, you know, the internet is filled with millions of people and you'd build a website and of course the, the client would say, where are all these millions of people then? <laughs> and answering that question is, is what I've been doing for the last 20 years and in those early days yeah there was absolutely no idea about traffic you know where does it come from how do people use the internet all of that has grown as, as we've started researching learning observing experimenting and of course it also changes every day you know if you'd said uh, 10 years ago that Facebook was going to be a major gatekeeper of people's time online people would have laughed. I, I think just the description of it probably would have made people laugh. Hang on, you mean lots of people share photos of their food with their families and that's <laughs> going to keep you busy all day? Yep, pretty much. Um, so it's it's been a fascinating journey for me. But the thing of the website, that's always fascinated me. It, it, beyond anything else. I think when you're talking about the potential of a website, it's easy to overlook it and think of it as something trivial. But we do that with other things too. If I held up a sheet of paper, you wouldn't think very much of it. But that has the potential to be almost anything. It's what you do with the paper. If I hand that piece of paper to Mark Twain, suddenly its value goes up immensely, doesn't it? Or how about Shakespeare? You know, and this is it. The, the value of a thing is what you allow it to be. And I think that's never more true than with a website. The only limitation is the limitations you set upon it. At the moment, it's a blank sheet and it can be anything, anything at all you want it to be. Great, great. Okay, Mary, what's your thoughts? Um, well, first I'd like to thank Gina, John, and Marilyn for inviting me onto the show to join all these great panelists. Um, but I think... You know, to the overall theme so far is that a lot of people, like, they leave their website out of the mix. And that's the big problem that I see with a lot of the people that I work with and I help with. I help them. Um, when I first meet them, they're not pulling the website into, um, they're not incorporating it into their business team. So you have to look at your website as if it's just a, it's another one of your employees. And it's an extremely powerful employee that has a lot of skills. But you have to utilize those skills, right? You have to put them to work. Um, and you, and think, you can think about putting them to work in so many different ways, like sales and marketing and customer service and automating business tasks. I mean, all kinds of ways. Um, and to start to open up your mindset to think about all the different ways that the website can join your business operations. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times I just, you know, to get people to start thinking about that, I just say, give your website some goals. And those goals should be um, related to your business goals. They should be um, improving them or contributing to them. And then create sort of a strategy and an action plan of how you're going to use your website to achieve those goals and then make sure that you have a, a measurement and a metric plan in place so that you can measure how you're doing and then take a look at that and continue to refine it and make it better. And you know when you start going down this this new attitude of actually pulling it into your business operations fold, it's going to take some time to learn how to use it, to get more efficient at it. And, Give yourself that time and that grace to come up to speed. A lot of people quit right in the beginning, and they're like, oh, this doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. But that's why you have to have metrics, right, so that you can look at what you're doing and refine it, and that's really going to help you come up to speed a lot faster. Very good. Uh, Mike, what's your thoughts? 
Well, uh, thanks for putting me third after all those great thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Basically what my thought is. Uh, no, I've, I've been selling stuff uh, internet related since probably 94, 95 or so. And uh, actually years ago I used to give little speeches to little groups of people across the country about the the opportunity the internet, the web, uh, was going to present uh, both from a business standpoint and education standpoint for our children, all that. All that. And, you know, it's funny, the things we talked about in the late 90s are now just really coming about. But my job traditionally, or usually what I do when I go in and work with a company, is to find revenue opportunities for them. So what that leads to is almost every time their website. Uh, because, you know, the truth is, or at least my opinion is, most small business owners would, uh, are, are idiots. Wait a minute, are there people watching this? No. <laughs> the, the fact is they're stressed. Uh, they have a lot to do in the three disciplines of running a business. They, they're covering it all, finance, operations, sales, and marketing. So the website becomes this little piece to them. And so my job is to kind of make them realize uh, its potential to them to save money, to communicate. And as I said in a post recently, I mean, really, the, the website becomes a manifestation, a digital manifestation of what their company is. Uh, and, and so it's thrilling to me to be able to help small and medium businesses with their internet uh, because it's really complicated, uh, which makes it very tough for me because I'm not that smart. But they don't have the time to learn it and, and know it. I just had a client, <laughs> as an example, I just had a client yesterday ask me, uh, he builds, he does major remodeling, million dollar remodeling. He says, do you really think it's important to have a professional photographer take shots of my work? And, and I was like, well, it depends you know, how you want your work to look to everybody. So uh, the web has always been like like probably everybody on the panel, a passion of mine. And, and I should say I really appreciate being here. Uh, and so that's what I do. Great. Thank well, you. I'm just going to pull out a couple of things from something each of you said that, that I particularly just struck me. I love um, Ammon's blank sheet of paper that we don't have to limit what we can do with our with our websites and it's our own limitations rather than the limitations of the website oftentimes that can get in the way and then Mary's analogy to the employee and having your website work for you I love that and also the goals that's I think something that often um, maybe particularly maybe not but I'm thinking particularly small business as Mel, uh, merging into what Mike was saying that the small business owner is juggling a lot of balls, wearing a lot of hats, and um, having goals for your website is may not have gotten a, a gotten, I was going to say may, may have been a priority, but maybe didn't even get on a list of things to do. So uh, there's some just some great introductory thoughts there. So thank you all three. Great. Okay, so we're going to start off uh, kind of uh, give some thoughts really at the first time if anybody has some ideas on sort of delineating what exactly is a business asset. I mean, where does that begin and end? I mean, is everything in the business a business asset? Or is that something we can define so that we can look at it and say, okay, that's a business asset and that isn't. You know, so some thoughts on that, sort of the fundamentals of a business asset. Bill, you have a thought on that. My website turns 10 years old in two weeks. Doing? It started out as uh, a place for me to make an announcement of a free meetup for internet marketers to get them away from the big conferences in the expensive cities with the costly hotels and the uh, high price tags of, of uh, admission. And I set it up uh, to have a meetup group in Havard Grace, Maryland. And I put information about beds and bed and breakfasts in the area, about hotels, and a lot of other stuff. The uh, event came and went. I had a number of people show up. We took a, a tour of the Chesapeake Bay on a skipjack, uh, which is a special type of ship you hunt oysters in. And uh, the event happened. And I had a website left. And I needed to do something with it. So I left the job I was working out, started up an internet marketing business, and uh, started blogging about uh, search engine-related patents. 
and my website. It got me invited to speak at conferences. Uh, it got me at least one plane trip out, out to Vegas from the East Coast. Uh, it's a productive endeavor, right? <laughs> it got me business yeah. from paying clients. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really good. Yeah. So for those of you in our audience, we don't have our camera, that you might recognize that famous voice of Bill Slosky, <laughs> who is, happens to have honored us by dropping in at, at our meetup since he has now moved out to this area. So yeah. welcome, Bill. Thanks yeah. for, Thanks for your continuing. Thoughts. Feel free to take my chair anytime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so let's, let's look at that business asset idea. Anybody have some more thoughts on that in the panel? Nina, anybody? So what is a business asset? Yeah, I certainly do. Oh, okay. Everything in your business is pretty much either going to be an asset or it's going to be a liability. And a lot of the choice of that is down to how you treat it and how much time you give it. If you give something more time than it's worth, it's probably going to become a liability. If you don't give something enough time for what it's worth, it's probably going to be a slight liability. Um, but the only way something becomes an asset is when you invest and give it value. You know, the, the value isn't innately in the code. The internet is that blank piece of paper. It's got the potential to be whatever you make it, but you've got to invest in this. And the more you invest in it, the more value you can put straight into it. One of the things I point out about a website is that it's a conversation that can happen even when you're asleep, that can happen in the thousands of different places all at the same time. A website isn't a brochure, it's a salesman that can be omnipresent in every single meeting anywhere in the world at once and cost you very, very little But compared to that. But I, I seriously think that monetary concerns, you should be investing the same amount into a website that you would invest into a salesman for you. Mm -hmm. As an employee, as somebody involved in your business as an employee, absolutely. That's that's really good. Any other thoughts before we move on? You know, yes, uh, I wanted Am in the start because he's a lot smarter than me, so I wanted to see what he's saying. <laughs> when you, seriously, but when you look at assets, you know, you have two types, right? You have appreciating and depreciating. And uh, you know the smart business owners and financial managers always look for the appreciating assets, uh, like land and bonds and things like that. A, a website can be your greatest appreciating appreciating uh, asset, and it should be. I mean, the reality is, generally, when you launch a website, it's not going to hit its full potential for a while. Uh, and as an appreciating asset, you need to pay attention to it. So you know, if you look at a, a website. As far as its value, it's going to start here, and depending on the attention, the budget, and the and how much uh, work you put into it, it's either going to go up, which it can go up enormously, or it's basically going to go down. So it's one of the, the actually it's one of the, in my opinion, one of the toughest assets to manage, but the payoff is so big. Uh, so things are either going up or down, and it's really the business owner's choice which way they they go with their website. Okay, we have well, we have a comment from from our audience. Uh, what was it, uh, Tanya? That's <laughs> for a donkey. There you go. <laughs> Very good. I love the, Tanya. Yeah. She always brings so much wit but clarity <laughs> in her comments. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, Okay, so we so we've we've covered a bunch of things. Um, what what are the one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning is is like website services where you go in and they set up a website for you and they're proprietary and all those kinds of things. What what are the what are the problems with that that you see um, and getting into one of those kinds of programs? What are the risks that you see occurring when you get into that proprietary? Free website that's all set up for you, kinds of things. Aside from the fact that that you really didn't think about your business before you started doing it, <laughs> that's an important one and probably the key one. But what are some other problems that that, that you see uh, happening in that in that scenario? Because that happens a lot. 
Scalability from our audience. Yep, very good. Yeah. Scaling. In well, I would, um, I would make sure that you can get your data if um, if something happens. So let's say you go into one of those relationships and um, you can't you can't move or take your or export your data. What happens if the relationship goes sour? Right? What happens if suddenly that a hosting provider or that package the provider of that package the customer service goes down they get bought their prices go up something happens you're not happy you want to take your website and go somewhere else if you can't grab your data then you're going to be looking at um, an expensive proposition to rebuild your website unless you were diligent enough to make copies of everything before you uploaded the website to the, the server and not everybody does that and you're constantly making websites um, in your CMS as you go along. So that's one of the things that you, you really have to look out for when you're going into that kind of a partnership. Yeah, that, that lack of portability is, is really reckless in my opinion and it's not just a matter, yeah, grabbing your data but the data in the shape that it's in in the website with the programming and the code that's putting it there. So basically, yeah, you can pull your content, but it won't have a container. So we've had so many clients come to us after those situations, and either with the GoDaddy-type websites or those kinds of free or inexpensive services, but also with reputable companies that don't explain to their clients, well, yeah, we're going to make you this incredible content management system, but it's our proprietary software. So if you don't want to stay with us in the future, you don't have any website when you leave. And I feel that that's, that's, a, that's out of integrity and it's a really dangerous thing that, that small businesses kind of walk into without really understanding. So for me, that's kind of where I sit on that topic. And also the, the SEO potential as far as I understand it, and God, we've got two incredible experts here, three really. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I kind of feel shy saying anything about it, but it's my understanding that it's also really hard to optimize, do any on-site optimization in those, in those uh, free sites. You know, one of the problems with the free sites, when I run into a client that's thinking of doing it or has one, is you know what? You just look bad. Uh, I mean, come on, have, has anybody seen a GoDaddy site or, you know, pick one of the free ones or even a Google free site that really looks good? And, you know, the reality is a business, uh, depending on your industry, you are competing against other like companies and their website. So uh, even though your customer prospect or potential investors or employees may look at your website and not know the technical reality of it, you know when you're looking at a template cheap website. Uh, so, why, why would you do that? It's, it's, uh, I don't, you know, the technical side of those, <coughs> they're really clunky. Uh, we do local SEO, and you know, they're tough to work with in that standpoint. But every client I've ever had who would have had that, basically, you've wasted your time, and your time is valuable because you're going to eventually, if you're a serious business, you're going to have to upgrade that to a real website anyway. Right. Uh, you know, so I hate them. You know the way you sometimes get those emails that come to you, usually from offshore somewhere, and it's so obviously a template, half the time they haven't even taken out the fields. Dear insert name here, I have visiting your website Bing. Would you exchange links with me, please? And you know how it immediately makes you think about the person who sent you this. Why would you want your website to look like that email? A template built without thought or with minimal effort. You know, this this is your chance to represent everything about your business to everybody worldwide. Give that the respect it deserves. You know, you are building a statue to your own company when you are building your website. Now you can build any kind of statue you want. Do you really want papier mache and a bit of polyfiller? <laughs> That's, that's right. Doggy paper mache. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a comment from uh, from our uh, online audience. Uh, Farnaz. Farnaz. Uh, 
knowing about both technology as well as business itself is a challenge for us, at least for me. But having a business on my website is like a dream. So she's definitely uh, uh, liking the idea of, of building her website. And uh, she's, she's a, a great follower of our show here, and she's always got some good, good uh, thoughts and stuff. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, brought up the idea, uh, came up about ownership. And I think that's something Gina has, has talked about a lot, about the real estate and, and ownership. Uh, let's explore that ownership idea and how, how that is so important because, as, as has already been mentioned, uh, you've got to be able to take it with you. you you've got you to have that freedom of, of moving to wherever you get the best service. And uh, if you can't do that, then, well, you better think about where you're at. So let's talk about the value of ownership as, as a business asset. Oh, Bill. Another quick addition here would be the that question so well. Okay. Okay, so I came up with the name of my website, which is SEO by the Sea. Well, looking overlooking the Chesapeake Bay and sailboats bouncing up and down in it. And when I decided to move, I had to move across the country. California to remain by the sea. I couldn't change it to SEO by the creek or SEO by the creek. That wouldn't work. No alliteration there. No, no. no, you know, I did think of that when you moved to California. I love that. Yeah. So that did occur to me. I, when I was in Virginia, I was closer to being an SEO by the hill. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't too far from the Shenandoah National Park, so we had some big hills. <laughs> Which is, a, is another great point, actually, the the whole thing of domain names. And, you know, we've learned that there can be incredible value in a domain. Because yeah, it's not name. just, it's not just, you know, how people type something in to find your site, but, you know, Domain names have a meaning. They already are the first contact people may have with what you're trying to to present. You know, a good sounding name works great. And I think there was a time when people got obsessed with search rankings, and you had those exact match domain names, which to me always sounded awful. You know, uh, best injury lawyers for you dot com is not a great name. It's never going to sound classy ever, no matter what you do. It's always going to sound like a bargain basement kind of website at, at best. Um, and I, I think it was always a mistake because there was search.com before there was Google. Which one was successful? There was books.com before there was Amazon. Which one was successful? And there was auctions.com before there was eBay. Which one was successful? And I think wherever you look across this domain name, it's always the one that portrays something, is memorable, um, and gives people the right feeling that wins every single time. And it's very rare that you find an exact match domain that ever does that. So, you know, where we start with value can be as simple as the name. And yes, getting the right name can be an investment itself. Sometimes the name you want is taken, or you may have to, you know, buy it from another site. Sometimes you can still find some great domain names. People do say, oh, the best domain names are taken, and yet every single week I find more wonderful domain names that I can't believe haven't been taken. So I think even there we start. You know, speaking of books.com, I knew the guy who bought that originally. Uh, <laughs> I, I did. I did. Uh, it was like in the 90s or, or whenever, and he, uh, although <clears throat> the domain was not successful, I can assure you he sold it for a lot of money. So there's a lot of things that that kind of is. I do want to mention, since this is the basics uh, kind of show, you know, the w number one challenge I see small and medium business owners having is not, it's really budget. It's understanding how much money they should invest. And I spend a lot of my time, at least effort, with new clients convincing them that they should invest every penny they can uh, into their web presence uh, because it can be such a great asset. So really the first challenge I see and I think business owners need to look at is how much money is it going to cost? What do I want to accomplish and how much money do I have? And then go borrow everything you can to throw into it. 
because I think we see a lot of free websites and bad websites, not, not necessarily because people aren't thinking. It's more that they don't have or did not allocate the money to do it correctly. And there's generally a, a not a very good sense when I speak to business owners of what they should spend. Uh, usually, I when somebody's saying, "Can I build a website?" They say, "Can I build it for eight hundred bucks? Can I build it for two thousand dollars?" And it depends on what it's going to do. Can I build it? But I, you know, it's like the reality is, you should invest every, in my opinion, every penny you possibly can into it to do it right. So I'd be interested from the other panelists and, and Gina and everybody, what do you think is a good amount for a small business to invest initially in a website? And I know that's hard to answer, but for, for a basic business website. I hate that question. <laughs> then, oh, then I, I retract the question. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. No. <laughs> well, this, you know, before you asked that question, what I wanted to pipe in with was, how's this for waffling, was that we can always work in phases. And one of the beauties of the current website systems that we're using now is that they're so malleable. And they're so easy to expand. I mean, the sites that we were making prior to, to content management systems were easy to expand. But we can change entire structures and, and focus and add and subtract and do a lot of stuff. So if a company can work with us to understand what's going to make the site an asset to their company in the first place and be able to figure out with us what all the different pieces are and what the potentials are, then it can be phased if the budget isn't there. And that, that can often be a really good solution for moving forward. You know, you get your really strong, good container, you have your necessary content, and then you build from there. It doesn't, you don't have to do everything all at once. And I'm not going to answer your other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, I will. Thank you. Um, it, it's one of those things. There's only one correct answer to that, and you nailed it earlier. Everything you can. It really is that That's simple. Perfect. If you if you buy a brand new truck for work, I guarantee you this is a depreciating asset. It's worth less when you sell it. <laughs> But your website, the more you invest it, it can actually be a lot more valuable when you put more into it yeah. than the cost of the things you put in. And there's very few other assets like that. Now, I've seen people build awesome websites on 80 bucks. I have. But they put in an awful lot of sweat equity, and put in a lot of time, they put in the content, and that probably added up to thousands. So I think overall, you're always looking at an investment of several thousand, probably a ballpark of around five thousand plus dollars is a minimum for a good website, but it doesn't all have to be cash. You can do a lot of that in sweat equity, you can do a lot of that in your own time going into that. But I think as a, a baseline you are looking at five thousand dollars worth of investment in some form or other. Now that Ammon said a number, I'll, I'll say I'll agree with him. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. We have, we have Jason with a comment here, T. Weiser, uh, saying depends on what the site is for. And I guess that's kind of what we talked about. Is it a brochure, a lead generator, e commerce, uh, con content like a, a blog type site? Yeah. I mean, each of these types of sites have different, different price points. I know if you get into a serious e commerce site, you can spend 15, 20, 30, 50,000 without batting an eye. You know, it's it's pretty easy to do because I've had customers that have gone way off into that. And well, here we have Julie. Uh, I I find also they do not really understand the nuts and bolts of online. And when we discuss what they do not understand, they avoid it and put it on the back burner. So yeah, it's it is something that happens when you don't understand the platform. You tend to Oh, geez, I think I'll move on to something else that I understand. Bill, you had a thought. Yeah, there are uh, costs that are associated with the cost of building the website, buying the software to build it, build, putting out the platform. There are open source platforms. There, I've, I've got one client who advertises nationally on television. You can probably pitch the commercial. Uh, three, four, or five times a day if you sit and watch TV too long. They're on a WordPress website, 
right? So they spent no money on software right. whatsoever. Uh, their uh, commercials draw a lot of search traffic. The characters in the commercials, people search on those. Yeah, but they probably put a lot more Right. right. So having the knowledge of what to put on that website, having the ideas of the technology that might be involved, that spend money on that. Thank you. You know, and I'd, I'd like to mention that when you're looking at budgeting or, or investing in your website, when I say that, I'm also talking about promoting that website too. So whether it's uh, via SEO, advertising, etc. Uh, you know, there's a budget. If you just do a website budget and don't include promotion of that website in whatever form it takes, you're making a mistake too. And, and I think you should put most of your money into SEO through either Bill, Ammon, or myself. <laughs> that's, that's just that's a personal opinion. But don't forget the budget for the for the uh, uh, advertising and SEO stuff. Yeah, and one of the things that's really important, if you're going to be thinking of your, your website as a business asset, then what you're understanding really is that your website is unique to your company. And because of that, this is why it can be so hard to give generalized ideas about pricing, because without a scope of work and understanding exactly what's involved, the numbers can just be all over the place. And we feel it's really irresponsible to say numbers until we've defined the scope of work and we have a really clear understanding of what all the details are and what we're actually going to be delivering. So, Said so. just like a good web designer. You know what I tell them? Three percent of your gross annual revenue should go on your website. And you know why I tell them that? Because it sounds smart and it works. <laughs> yeah, and this is why we're going to hire you to talk for me. <laughs> we, do, we do that, but yeah, we yeah. talk for you. <laughs> it sounds smart. <laughs> Very good, uh, Gina. Do you have do you have a, a topic area that that you want to dive into right now, or? Um, let me give that some thought. Okay, okay. I'll be back to you on okay. it. I'll be back to you on that. Okay. okay. Uh, speaking of of the website and the and the uh, technology in there, uh, what are some thoughts on uh, on uh, content management systems and and whatnot? I know Ammon, you've often talked about, you know. Uh, Putting together that small basic HTML site as being a good place to start for some businesses that you've worked with. So maybe you can address that and, and, and explore that thought because that's who, who I was thinking of when I when I when I put that down on my sheet here was I was thinking of your your little discussion on that topic. So take you remember away. what we were we were saying about you know templates earlier. Well, WordPress is the most recognizable template in the world, the way most people use it. You can make it look incredibly different, but unfortunately, it is a template. It is a system that everyone is used to, and because it's built to be used by so many different kinds of applications, it's bloated. It's got a load of stuff in there that you don't need. It's going to use a lot more processing than most small businesses are going to be able to to use it, you know, you end up with adding in lots of plugins you don't need that aren't adding value that slow it down even more and damage your security. So most of the time, I would say, small business, you're much better off starting off with a static website, even a you know sort of five to fifteen page static website, then add a blog as an added part, keep it slightly separate so that if people get into that part, they're not able to get into the root of the site, only into the the blog part and invest in getting a good developer to give you a unique skin that is as stripped down a version of, of WordPress as you can possibly find. Personally, when I'm moving up to medium and large businesses, I'm always advising that they either get their own content management system or heavily invest in rewiring parts of WordPress. You know, getting a real PHP developer in to configure that system to work more economically than it usually does. It's a bit like getting a stock car and then tuning it to work in races because in, in business you often are in a race. You know, you're in a competitive environment and the last thing you want to do is start with no edge over anybody else. You're using exactly the same thing in the same way as everyone else but they've got a two-year head start. Guess what? In two years they're going to have a four-year head start. You're still going to be, you know, at least two years behind. It, it, you've got to give yourself an advantage, and often that is choosing to have something unique. 
Yeah, yeah. One of the things I've seen a lot with people come to me is is that they just love to put those plugins in. They'll they'll have more plugins than you can shake a stick at. And then the other problem is is they turn off the plugins as they're playing with them, and then they leave them sitting there. So guess what? The plug plugins active, but it's not really being used. And and of course then it's a if you don't upgrade it, you're a target a security target. So that that's becomes its own problem. So I frequently find myself deleting a lot of plugins from clients that get started. Uh, Jason has a thought here. Um, market, marketing should be uh, yes, it says free. free. Free, okay, <laughs> which includes the cost of your website, your SEO, your advertising, and so on. What I mean is that your car, spend 5000 on a website. You can. You can. Uh, why would I get car? Because it's fuzzy, that's why. And, and that will never uh, generate one dime. If that's the case, then the site is built wrong. In other words, you got to think in terms of what you're spending and the return on investment. I guess is where where that thought is going. He's saying if you spend five thousand dollars on the website. I think a lot of the time, the kind of marketing that you get thrown in with a website is a bit like the kind of website you get thrown in with your hosting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny how you know the developers will, will see that. The free website wasn't worth much, but they won't see that the free marketing wasn't worth much. But the fact <laughs> is, you, you build a website, that's great. But it's then how you reach out and how you continue to keep in touch with your market, listening to your market, responding to your market, understanding your competition, heading them off, and repositioning yourself constantly. Because you have to reposition yourself constantly. The world is always changing. Your competition is always changing. The circumstances are always changing. Mm -hmm. You know, the economy goes up and down, and that can affect where people are prepared to spend their money. And just by simply changing a couple of words in how you present what your offering does, that can differentiate between whether they continue to buy in an economic downturn invest more in it in an economic downturn because they see this as the most efficient spend or whether they see it as an expense that they cut in an economic downturn. So, uh, you know, marketing is not a fire and forget solution. It's something that is always ongoing. The same as web development is. Your website is never finished. Okay. Um, Bill's got a thought here and then we'll, we'll throw the ball back to Gina. Okay, one, one thing to keep in mind is your marketing is a conversation with your intended audience, the people who might be interested in the services that you provide or the goods that you offer. And your website is the centerpiece of that. Your website is your pub where all those thoughts and ideas that you share come from. You may use uh, social media to connect to people or newsletters or something like that, but the place you send people back to for more information or to, to contact you or to, uh, so on is your website. Yeah, the hub idea. That's really good. Yeah, really. Absolutely. absolutely. I think I think uh, several people have brought that hub idea. That's, that's a really good one. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think that uh, the important thing that people don't need to keep in mind is that price is what you pay and value is what you get. And you can't put a price on value. You know, once you once you figured out what the value is going to be, you put a price on that. And I think that we're led to believe on the internet that there's magic buttons and magic pieces of code, and, and uh, there's these things that just uh, you can put in your website. And now you're going to make a bunch of money and retire, and it's all going to be good. And <laughs> people think there are. I think <laughs> for a for a small business owner needs to realize that uh, everything that's being done to your website. Too. And for people to work, they get paid for work. People are doing the work. You know, yeah. even if there is magic things and people that are really good at what they do, they're the ones doing it. They're investing their time, to, and it's going to cost you money to get someone to do what you want to get out of it. Yeah. And so it's not really this big secret uh, cloak or anything like that. It's you find a valuable person that can do what you know they're doing, and you pay them to do it. Yeah, I, I always talk to people to refer to it as the easy button. We got to be careful with that easy button. Okay, Gina, I'm pa passing the ball back to you. Okay, great. I, I actually wanted to go back to something that's been mentioned here and there, and Ammon has already kind of addressed it. He read my mind, but I think we can still go back into it. Um, the way I look at it is that the business is informing the website that we're going to create. 
And then the website begins to inform the business. And we've created this kind of continuous loop between the people in the business and the way the business is operating and the website and the way that is operating. So really the relationship that you have with your website, the ongoing relationship, not just during the development stages, which is what I see a lot of our clients kind of imagining from the start that finally when they get done and it's launched, they're finished. But that's really just the beginning. And so I wanted to just ask the panel some more about some specifics for our audience about what do we mean when we talk about that relationship and how can they keep their website fresh and alive and current and vibrant? And um, so, yeah, that's my question, you know, just some specifics on that. I'll throw in a quick one. And you can boil it down to one word, relevance. Relevance is always changing because context changes. To be relevant, you've got to be in touch with context. But relevance is what keeps the business alive. It's what makes it valuable to die. It's sometimes um, quite possible to make something that stays relevant for a long, long time. You know, we mentioned earlier Mark Twain and Shakespeare. They, their, their words, their stories are still valuable. They still resonate with us today because they were about essential parts of human nature. And when your marketing is done right, that part is also going to stay relevant. But I think there is always a lot of value in the adaptation of those classics as well, which is where they take that classic and all of its goodness that's lasted through the ages and bring it right bang up to date with, with new context, with new relevance. And I think if you are always bearing that in mind with your website, you're making it more relevant to today all of the time, you are maximizing the possible value of that website. Relevance and context, yeah. Great words. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> to that thought, Gina, I, I kind of, blame is the wrong word, but I kind of put this on the, a lot of web designers. It's because, and I don't blame them. It's like um, somebody calls them and says, I want a website, and they basically go through what do you want, and they put together the content, blah, blah, blah. But they don't discuss at that point, point. I think it's their responsibility, how do you want to grow this? What else do you want to do with it? The, the phases you were talking about. What you know, uh, if I'm a web developer, and thank goodness I'm not, uh, then you know I, I would be putting together an annual plan with every client of what they want to do with it because things change so quick. They should be taking care of the opportunities and content uh, opportunities and training opportunities on their website and how they can interact with their customers. I have a, probably one of my best clients. You know, their customers use that website a lot to make choices in the things that they sell. So instead of going out to their houses or going out to their businesses, they can actually go on, log in, and choose the things they want. I've got a client that does all their training on their website. Uh, not all of it, but 80% of their training is done uh, and scored through it. You know, their finances are done through it. So it's like, it's never, it's like everybody says, it's never over, but I put that on the web designer because that that's the person they, tr at least, it, I'd like to see them talk a lot more about it. Jason uh, Wizzer, or whatever his name was, who put that up there. I'm joking. I know Jason. Uh, you know, <laughs> he's a guy who I talk uh, to about web design a lot. And he does the same thing. It's like, what else do we want to do? These are. But I think as a web design community, that group, and we can do a better job of saying it's not over yet. There's lots more to do. We've got to stay with us. Yeah, I really agree with you. And I also know that when we get into the trenches of developing a site with the client. I think it was Ammon who started out just by talking ab about how the resources of small businesses are so taxed. And um, so by the time we get through being in the trenches together, everybody kind of needs to disperse for a little while in order to come back together with some renewed and refreshed energy. Because even just getting content can be a real trial for a lot of small businesses and small organizations and even for the large ones actually. That's the spot that slows down, is the biggest slowdown for any project from what we've seen. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right and we and more and more every day that's a true statement what you're talking about. It's just get that demand is growing constantly. So we all need to be really thinking about that and addressing that. Myself included. 
Yeah. Coming, coming back to what Jason said earlier about you know the kind of website dictates what it's going to cost and, and things like that. The kind of business dictates a lot of these things, and that's not just you know what business field you're in, but also what resources you have. Um, do you want a blog? Well, who have you got to write in that blog? Because if you don't have somebody who's going to have three hours every single week to write one good post or a couple of quick posts, there's no point having a blog at all. And you've got to be realistic about that. There's no point starting a blog and three weeks later you find you can't continue it. It was, it was a waste of development. It was a waste of putting it on there. And now you also, you know, you've, you've made the step of adding something to your site and then having to take it away again. Uh, you know, That's trust. negative marketing. Yeah. 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 Very, very good. Very good. Uh, Mary, did you have something? Yeah, to add on to this point, um, I think you know, designers have to start taking it on taking it on themselves to have those conversations up front. I mean, when you start talking about goals and things like that with your um, client, I think you also have to ask the question of how do you plan to use the site to help your business grow? How do you plan to bring people to the site? How do you plan to incorporate the site into your sales process? Um, and and because I think most clients, back to my point, most clients do depend on the designer to start to lead it. Um, and if you, as a designer, if you don't feel comfortable having those conversations, then find a partner who is. You know, bring someone else in. We can start to have those conversations up front with the client. Because that's, that's the whole way you're going to get them to start thinking about the, the website more as a business asset. Yeah. It goes hand in hand with learning about who the customer is, who's the client's customer, and the customer persona. So when you're, when you're looking at who the visitors to the website are going to be, then we're also talking about how can we serve those visitors best, how can we serve those clients, and how can we work towards conversion, converting those clients into customers. So yeah, that, it does need to be a conversation that happens right from the start, and it's, it's interdependent with all of those other issues. Yeah. No, I think that's... That's really great. I'll, I'll, I've got a, somebody in the audience here that wants to pipe in, but I'm going to just agree with that totally, completely, utterly. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, I won't say anything more because it's all been said, but I agree completely. Okay? <laughs> Conversation. We, we have a, somebody out here in our audience who has a time here. Uh, I just wanted to say from the other side of the coin, uh, the you know, the web developers and the SEO guys and everybody says that same thing all the time. Well, why don't we sit down and you tell me what you plan on the website to do? Are you kidding me? Like, what? How the hell do I know? If I knew that, then I would be building a website. And I think that a lot of that buck gets passed. And really, what's frustrating as the client is, it's like I expect to go to a web guy and say, "This is what I do. This is my industry. You tell me where the clients come from. You tell me what kind of website. You tell me, you know, that kind of stuff." So. I think that it also goes both ways. And yes, somebody needs to be able to say, uh, yes, I want it to do this and I want that. And if you don't have clear goals, then how do you it's going to help you? you got to know something. Uh, but this is a really hard thing to nail down. This. And that's why professionals like you guys exist. Yeah. You know, so. one, one of the problems that I see in that area is that a lot of people that get into web development come into it because either they built their own website and they had fun doing it, or they are technically oriented and, and you know, because they're technically oriented, they, they, uh, they, they think it's cool, but they don't have that background in the marketing and the SEO. So the problem is, is they're selling something and they're not willing to say, I can build this for you, but we're going to have to bring in some other people to talk to have that conversation because before I can build it, we need to have that conversation first, right? Okay. Bill, you want to add to that? Yeah, the creation of a website is a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. It needs to be. Right. We need a subject matter expert who knows their business well enough to tell us what their audience finds interesting about it and what they need to know more about. We know how to reach out to people. But well, we want to hear your message, and we want to present it in an authentic way. Right. Very good. Okay, unfortunately, we are, whew, the time just disappeared, and, 
and went zoom zoom and and uh, uh, Jason's got a good comment there but I'm gonna have to slide right by you Jason I'm sorry uh, you know take a look at on the comments uh, he has a really good comment there and oh, microphone just went went uh, been moving it around too much and it almost it almost went limp on us um, <laughs> So let's 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 wrap around here to everybody to give some parting thoughts. I, I had some specific ideas, but but since we're a little short on time, uh, let's just just go around go around the um, go around and and give some parting thoughts. Emma, why don't you give us some, your your parting thoughts on this on this topic today? Well, I, I quickly want to jump on that last thing because this isn't just a small business issue of you know well we don't know what's possible. It, it's always a thing you don't know what you don't know. And one of the things going into large clients is that sometimes when I went in, this was the first time that the marketing department and the web development department had sat in a room with somebody who could translate between them. And within five minutes, they'd got the full value out of my time just on that alone because finally they were able to talk each other's language. Because I'd say, well, you really want your database to be able to return this information to you and, and return these metrics. And I'd say that to the marketing guys, and the web devs are nodding because it was in their language, and marketers were, yeah. And the web devs, why didn't you tell us? And, you know, likewise, you, you could just pass the things between them. Because I knew both sides, I was able to, to say the things that were obvious to one side but were completely invisible to the other. <laughs> When you hire people, you often hire a specialist who knows their one area. And the reason you hire them is because they're cheaper than an expert who knows eight areas. When you hire a web dev, you always tend to look at the price. And what you're paying for when you go for a cheaper web developer is the amount of experience in areas outside of web development. So be aware that when you go to a web developer and you have shopped on price at all, You've taken away some of the broader skills, and you need to be filling that in yourself, or you need to be bringing in another expert. So there are times when you can talk to your web dev, and he's just going to want to know what you want it to look like, what you want to define, because that's the kind of web dev you've chosen to work with, and you did that by shopping on price. Mm -hmm. Very good, Mary. Um, I'd like to add that one of the answers to a question John threw out to us before this event um, is that. What happens if um, you don't really do this due diligence upfront, and you think about you really think about how you're going to use your website um, in the context of your business operations? And I think the biggest risk you take is that um, you're going to invest in something, and it's not going to suit your needs. And you're going to understand that either while you're in the middle of building this website, or actual after the website has launched. And I have a really good story I'd like to share where I was actually talking to a city government about their website. And at the time they were talking to me, they had just signed a contract with um, a supplier who built websites specifically for government niches. And they were, um, and, and they signed that contract. And at the same time, the city wanted to launch um, high standard services to the citizens within that city as a service and they were competing with the likes of Comcast and a local provider that had a big market share. Um, and they had the foresight to try to do something unique in their niche and that was make money by selling services. Well I asked them this question, do you want to market those services through search engine optimization? And they said, oh yeah, 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 that's a great idea, we really want to do that and we want to hire someone to be able to do that. And I said, okay. And then I went back and I took a look at the platform that they were signing on to. And I realized it had no SEO features. Couldn't add any optimization. So I called up the platform provider and I said, why are they signing up with this platform that doesn't have any SEO features? And they said to me, because city governments don't have to use search marketing. And I was appalled. And I was like, oh my god, they just missed this great opportunity. And what happened was they clicked that easy button. They said, I want to just go with this package because they understand my niche. And the bottom line is that they needed something unique and they needed unique website services to make them unique. And they shot themselves in the foot by, take, by clicking the easy button. Yeah, very good. Okay, Mike, we'll pass the ball to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
<laughs> That's my fake freeze. <laughs> it, it just occurs to me, I wanted to make this point, that uh, I've had been lucky to have some really great clients in, in where I'm at in Colorado, but I've had four make the uh, Business Journal's fastest growing list and get all sorts of awards. Those four companies uh, are the ones that have taken their website far more seriously than any other clients I have. They've invested lots of dollars and they've also brought in really good quality web designers and people to help them with it. So th it's an interesting uh, correlation between success, at least in my little client group, uh, and failure to a certain extent is just being smart about your website also translates into being smart probably in business. So uh, I think all the points here were by Mary and Ammon and everybody were excellent, but bring in great people, bring in the best people you can to help you with the website. Big thinkers, great people, and don't use your buddy's uncle who's just <laughs> on parole in the garage. But, you know, get the right people. Tina, do you want to have a parting shot here? Yeah, I do. I, you know, a big part of our job is education. And a big part of our client's job to work with us is education. Because we need to learn about their company and they need to learn about what it is we might be able to do with them for them. And there's this giant dialogue that's going on the entire time through the whole process and beyond. And so, you know, I really agree with Bill. It's a collaboration, and we tell everybody that the first time we meet them. And the, the level to which they're willing to engage in collaborating will vary, obviously. And the amount of executive decision-making power they're going to give us will vary. But the, the ideal setup is for a really healthy collaborative relationship client to developer and we always bring in we work with a number of teams and a number number of specialists Doug and I are just the nucleus of fat eyes web development even though we do a lot in house we have these these specialists that we also work with because we never know what each client is going to need most and so, so the parting word that I have is just that we're all educating each other and we all need to be willing to have those dialogues and to have those conversations and to be constantly asking questions. I've also had experience with, with numbers of teams that aren't speaking to each other. We walk into the room and suddenly these light bulbs are going off and it's, like, and it's just really remarkable that all it takes is a facilitator for just a few minutes for them to realize what's happening. So. At any rate, that's my parting thought, and I would just, you know, dialogue, collaboration, education, uh, great conversation, everyone. We really appreciated all yeah. of your comments. Yeah, this has been great, and yeah, we've run over by about 10 minutes, but I just couldn't turn the spigot off, you know. It's <laughs> such good stuff going on here, I just couldn't say stop. So, but we are going to have to stop because, you know, that's what happens, and so I'm going to pass this over to Marilyn. Now that we're out of time, he's passing <laughs> it over to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's going to kind of wrap up for, and tell us a little bit about the uh, what's coming up next? Um, well, we're really excited to continue this series. Uh, we have next month coming up, um, making your business more web-centric. Really quickly here, since we are out of time, just excited to let you know that we have Stefan Hovnanian and Maana Stevenson coming on board to discuss. And oh, maybe more. But and we're maybe on. more. And and um, our gracious and knowledgeable co-host for this series, Gina Fidel, will be with us also. Um, huge thanks today to uh, Gina and Ammon and Mary and Mike. Just wonderful conversation and uh, thanks also to our in, uh, live audience here in Oceanside but let's give our panel a hand <laughs> and we hope to see you next month which will be on a Monday this time uh, July 13th for making your web, uh, web uh, your business more web centric, web -centric. There you go. <laughs> all right okay. see you all next time see you all bye bye, bye. Bye, thanks. Bye. See ya.